This message is brought to you by danmolerarchive.com, the number one place to search over 2,500 Dan Moeller messages in growing. Now, please enjoy this message. <laughs> the fisher of men. <laughs> Are you glad to say Oh, my goodness. <laughs> All right. Praise God. You guys can sit down. That was a different intro. <laughs> I was like, I didn't know you had that picture. <laughs> that was a big hell of it. He was really good, too. <laughs> he was big. When we landed him, he spit out a man that wasn't in the will of God. He was... <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Jonah, hello. <laughs> no, no. It was 163 pounds. It was two inches shy of six feet long. And uh, that's why I couldn't get a good grip on it to hold it up. So we were celebrating and thanking the Lord. I was with some good Christian men that were blessing me and took me to Alaska. I dropped my line back down in the water and caught a 148 pounder. <laughs> that when I lifted, I have that on a good picture, got him the whole way up. But the 163 pounder tore me up. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> But boy, are they good eating too. Oh my, how'd, how'd we get a fish picture up there? Wow. No, who knows it's, uh, it's okay to go and have fun and be on the seas of Alaska. You just don't do anything that you do outside of Christ. So when we're in on the dock and the guy's off the salmon boat and he's coming across with a boot on and he's a commercial guy, he's on that boat, he's making a living doing what he's doing and he's hobbling, he's on his feet all day, he's working hard. Yeah? And you're at, you're on your boat with your friends and having a great time, but you see that stuff. We all see that stuff. And I just said, man, what did you do? What happened? And he told me, and he tore a muscle, a ligament, a muscle, something that's in the bottom of his foot off of, away from a bone and painful, It'd take a long time to heal. And he said he couldn't just sit still he had to be on the boat and he's wearing his boot to try to work and not damage it more but it was not healing for him because he was always on it you follow me yeah. listen you just go for this stuff you don't get so theological and you don't sit and debate over healing you just pray for people yeah. it's just simple just yeah. pray for somebody and quit arguing <laughs> just pray for somebody <laughs> well yeah but wonder if and how <laughs> I just said, hey, what's going on? What did you do, man? He told me the whole story. And I said, look, I don't know what you believe. I don't know really anything about you, sir. I'm all the way from Pennsylvania, but I'd be so honored and humbled if you'd allow me to pray for your foot. And that's just believe God. I got a little emotional because the Lord will do that to you because you care. I just ran over there. He said, okay. And I knelt down and put my hand over that boot and prayed for his foot. So I got home because I was leaving that day. We were out in the boat for 10 days. So I was just on a boat for 10 days and never got off. We just anchored in the bay. We just went back around the rocks, out of the wind, cleaned our fish, worshiped the Lord, fellowshiped. We even received communion on the boat. Oh, it was so fun. Sun setting, sun rising. Oh, it was just 10 days, never got off the boat. Now I got off the boat and I saw a person outside of the people I was with and got to pray for him. My friend that invited me up there called me when I got home two days later. He said, hey, and I said, hey, buddy, thank you so much. He said, listen, you remember the guy you prayed for? I said, yeah, yeah, on the dock. He said, he came walking up and said, I guess your friend is gone. He said, oh, yeah, he flew out that day. He said, well, the next morning I woke up and realized I didn't have any pain. He said, and these Alaskan people are, they are rugged people. Like they're just, they're out there riding bikes in the rain. It's snowing, and they're just like, it's, they're just rugged people, man. They kind of pride themselves in that. I, I asked the one lady one day, and she was like, we're Alaskans. And I was like, 
This is, this is how he told me. He got up. He had no pain. He did all his work all day on the boat and did all his stuff. And the next day he got up. I forget how many miles he walked through the mountains before he went out on the water with no boot, no pain. Just, I mean, he had shoes on, but not that boot. <laughs> Completely healed. Stopped to tell my friend that his foot was healed. And it was something tore away from the bone that was hurting him terribly. He just got nothing to lose. He just got to go for it. You say, well, wonder if nothing happens. Well, wonder if you don't ever step out in faith. Then nothing ever happens. <laughs> so the thing you're worried about, you always have. And then you just drink coffee and argue over theology and never release any faith. And use your own experiences to validate your belief instead of Jesus' life and Jesus' word. Oops, I'm on you a little bit right now. <laughs> oh, I've seen it. And then people have their stories. Well, this happened and I prayed and this happened. Well, yeah, whoa, whoa, back up. We're all growing. We got calmed down. Some of us, look, I'm not being smart. I'm not talking to you. I'm looking up. Some of us have a hard time maintaining a healthy attitude. And we think because we read a scripture, we apply it, it's going to work. It's not a formula. It's a life we become. And it's a life that we live. Because when you become it, you live it. So when you actually see him and believe him like you can, and then the guy's walking, it's just normal to say, hey, can I pray? Worst he can probably do is say no. I mean, I guess he could pull out a revolver and shoot me. I don't know, but that's probably not, ha that never happened. <laughs> The worst he can probably do is say no. Right. I've gotten scolded. I've gotten people frustrated. You think, oh, well, you're, trying, you're trying to slice me. You get mad. They don't understand. It's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just a reflection of where people are. But you still got to love people. You still got to sow a seed. If you don't sow, nothing's going to grow. We always want this great harvest. Okay, so sow a seed. I wonder if every one of us in here would just start sowing seeds. I understand praying for our city. What about sowing seeds into our city? And as you're sowing seeds into your city, praying for your city. Don't just pray for your city. Love somebody. Pray for somebody. Release faith. Amen? And don't get caught up. In a bunch of debates and a bunch of stuff. I've been in, I've, I've had so many people, leaders and people that don't believe the same thing. Yeah, but, and they're always contesting with questions and stuff. Don't get caught in that stuff. You're not in an argument with people. You're privileged to live your life in Christ. I'm just too, you're too late to debate with me. Like I'm having way too much fun. <laughs> like I'm not going to sit back and say, yeah, but, and try to prove my point. I'm just going to stop the man with a boot and pray for him. Your theology doesn't allow you to do that. So you don't have that resume, that testimony. You won't have that fruit. But I'm going to have some of that. <laughs> you know, in this the Father's well pleased that you bear. <laughs> These signs shall follow those that. So if you don't believe, you don't have those stories. And then not having those stories justifies what you believe. That's backwards. Here's where you get faith. You look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. In fact, we got to do this because there's something we got to do today. You know, pastor was saying, Pastor Tim was saying, when I first heard Dan, I'm like, what Bible does he have? <laughs> but you know what struck me when I got saved? It's what nobody ever told me, Pastor Tim. Nobody ever told me why God really sent his son. They just told me I was a sinner and I needed to ask for forgiveness and I needed to pray a prayer so that I could get my name in a book called Life and get forgiven. That's all I ever heard in church growing up. You're a sinner and Jesus died on the cross to forgive you of your sin. Nobody said Jesus died to put his life in you, to transform you, to, to call you out of darkness into the light in the sense that I could walk in the light as he's in the light. 
not get entangled again in the affairs of this life and be transformed because I'm not thinking like the world anymore, but I'm actually living Christ now and living by the Spirit. And nobody ever taught me that when I went to church. When I went to church, they just said I was a sinner and I needed to pray this prayer so that when the bell rings, I'm on the right team. Isn't that what, is that what most of you heard growing up? And then when you say something about living the life and go, oh, yeah, but brother, we're always just, and you know the heart, it's just always, and we're just always gonna, and it's just always why we gotta fail, why we gotta be messed up. Nobody ever told me that I could actually live in the Spirit until I read my Bible, and my Bible said to live in the Spirit. And that if I live in the Spirit, I won't even fulfill the lust of the flesh. You can't even hardly preach that in most churches. Because they'll try to convince you why you have to live in the flesh. My Bible says you won't. If you live in the Spirit. Yeah? Come on. Uh. So see, it wasn't that I was reading a different Bible. I just saw something different, and when I saw something different, it changed everything, and I realized everything I saw was right there. It was right there. I started finding every scripture I started seeing through this one truth, that he wanted to not just forgive me, but live inside of me, new beginning, transform my life, put himself in me, put who he is in me so that the Christ in me could be the hope of glory, so that I could actually express him without even trying hard. Just make me think different, believe different, and see different, and have a different motivation, a different pursuit in life, a different reason for being, a different motivation, a different why. All of a sudden, I'm not just trying to survive and get by and, oh, God, help me, and, oh, God, provide for me, and, oh, God, bless me, and, oh, God, protect me. No, transform me. Put your life in me so that I can look through your eyes and live from your heart and manifest everything you created me for and paid to restore. Teach me how to live apart from sin. Teach me how to live in the spirit. Teach me how to walk in love and show mercy and make peace and not be an offended man, a religious man that goes through all the motions without the life of Christ on the inside. <sighs> the worship team. They messed me up tonight. It was their fault. They sang all them crazy good songs. Gee. I leaned over to pastor. I said, we're not just preaching this stuff anymore. We're singing it. Like really singing it. Ooh. Somebody just might start believing it. Might actually start believing their, their life is worth living in him. See, here's what I learned. Here's what I learned. When I, went, I grew up in church, so I was about 20. I quit going. I didn't go for a long time. Jesus came and rescued me at age 33 in the workplace. I was a lost man. I wasn't doing crazy, stupid stuff. I was just lost. I was empty. My life was a zero. I was super self-centered, super self-conscious. I didn't like me. I wanted you to like me, to think I was likable. I needed attention, I needed affirmation, because I was insecure, and I didn't feel like my life really mattered. I used to think about that now and then. My life was a zero. I wasn't producing anything that was worth reproducing. And one day Jesus came, and he changed me. When he changed me, what I realized was Almost every circle I grew up in, almost every time I heard the gospel, almost every Christian that I had known was more in a, a mode of survival, using God to get through life, praying to get by and get things to work the way they hoped and thought they needed. It wasn't about becoming something totally different. It wasn't really about putting off the old putting on the new. It was about getting something from him instead of becoming something because of him. It was about getting your need met instead of your life transformed. So you had a lot of disgruntled, discouraged, faithless people that went to church that were full of questions and worry and wonder where God's been. You had people on the run looking at life and life deciding who they are and then running to God, help. 
and all their prayers motivated by trouble. All their language is birthed out of trouble. And they don't even have a relationship. They just have a hope that he'll do something about what they're struggling with. <sighs> and see, I saw that. Holy Spirit showed that to me clear. That's not what he wooed me for when I was 33 years old in the world. He didn't come so that I could have that. He came so that I could know him, so that everything he wanted to do in my life could take place. He, he started to teach me if I didn't have love, I didn't have anything. I could have a massive bank account. I could have an amazing IRA saved up. I could have every physical need met. If I don't have love, I got nothing. Why? Because I'm zero. I'm to myself. Unless I die and fall to the ground, spring up and bear much fruit, unless this seed, you're a seed, unless this seed, you're a seed, unless this seed dies, it abides alone because it's always living for itself. And even the people around you are for you. Even the people you gather around you, your relationships, your friendships, it's because it serves you. It's because it makes you feel good, complete, supported, confident. That's why when one of those things gets out of place, we so fall apart because we're so dependent on that peace. All of a sudden, it's not even a relationship, it's a need. And it's to feed something called self, which is deception. It was never from God. So Holy Spirit taught me in the bedroom that if I didn't have love, I got nothing. And if I did anything for me or for my sake, zero, I already got my reward in full. That's why there's so much hurt, so much pain, so much unforgiveness. We don't understand it. In the church, there's all those things. Insecurity, low esteem, frustration, anxiety, fear. Why? Because we're still trying to get who we are through others. Man, we need to lock arms. We need to hook up, become one, and become an army but not for need's sake, not for identity's sake. We get our identity from him. We get our encouragement from him. If I need it from you, it's not wrong for you to encourage me. It's not wrong for me to encourage you, but if I need it from you, I'm only as good as you're doing. And then you become my reason I'm not okay. And now I'm always interdependent and I can never just be free. <laughs> You've known me since 2009. A lot of people in my circle have known me since I've been saved, but you've known me since 2009. I've had this excitement since then, haven't I? Is it, am I more, am I, am I going? Was I excited when you first met me and passionate? But I haven't changed in the way of diminished. Time hasn't changed a thing. Why? Truth hasn't changed. So you can get your eyes off of truth, but that's a tough day because it's truth that makes you free. So if you get your eyes off of truth, you're going back into some kind of bondage because you're going to believe a lie. You're going to live by something that's not true. Yeah, but they did that to me. Okay, wonder if God had that language. See, you slip back into the wisdom of the world and all of a sudden you take account of suffered wrongs. And all of a sudden you seek your own and you turn self-centered. You draw back into something that's needy. That's why you got to guard your heart. Out of your heart flow, you got to guard your heart. Out of the heart flows the issues of life, right? That's why we're supposed to sharpen one another. Why? Because I want to show you something. Because we're all in a race. There's a goal. There's, there's a big charge. Like, doo -doo, we're supposed to be doing something in Christ. And that this doesn't mean your respective ministry. That means the way we all live. We're to be walking as lights in the earth. We're supposed to see this thing that he paid for. There's, there's a motive in Christianity that I get concerned is missing at large. And we're a Christian for our sake. If you're a Christian for your sake, it's easy to get frustrated, discouraged, bewildered. You can even get mad at God and justify it because of the facts. 
Well, yeah, but I prayed and prayed and prayed. And he said in his word, and I prayed and prayed. And, and all of a sudden, you're not even in covenant with God. You're just reading his word. And if he ain't doing what, then you got issues. All of a sudden, you reduce him to your busboy, your servant, your table waiter. I don't know. But not your father. Are you all okay? Yeah. See, I, it wasn't that I was reading another Bible. It, I saw something in the Bible that nobody ever showed me. Why God actually sent his son. I know it sounds so silly. You can go to a majority of churches all across the nation and say, why did God send his son? And you'll get almost majority, same answer all over the country. To forgive your sins so you can go to heaven. That's why. He did not die on the cross to forgive your sins so you go to heaven. He had to die to forgive your sins, and your sins did get forgiven. So he had to forgive your sins. He died on the cross to restore you back to the Father so he could put his life in you so you could walk in the light as he's in the light so that sin would have no power or dominion as if sin never happened so that righteousness would reign on the earth and the kingdom of God is at hand. And you don't look here and you don't look there because it's in you. Yeah, nobody ever told me why God sent his son. And when I started to see it and talk about it, some people were like, what? But a lot of people were like, what? Because it made sense to their heart. And all of a sudden they realized, wait a minute. Man, I'm called to something. He paid for something to live in me called Holy Spirit. To be one with him. So that I could be in the world, but never of it. That's what these scriptures mean. Like to walk in the light as he's in the light. Having the why straight in your life. Waking up with pinpoint accuracy in your motive. Like not losing sight of the why. If you get tricked into just existing, then you're not shining. You're surviving. And it feels like it barely surviving. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying? If, if you get tricked into just being self-centered, wonder if you get tricked into feeling sorry for yourself. And now all your prayers are motivated by feeling sorry for yourself because of the circumstance. You got all the facts laid out and the three friends you told all cried with you and felt like you felt and that's your support system. And all of a sudden, the way that seemeth right to a man that always leads to death and destruction is the way. Y'all with me? Oh, he taught me something a long time ago. That's why I've been like this. Because what I'm preaching is freedom. I don't even have to try hard. He came and got me. He loved me. He said, hey, you're all messed up. Love you. <laughs> you're thinking wrong. Love you. He tells me in Colossians, I was an alienated and an enemy by the wicked way my mind was working, yet he reconciled me through the body of his death so he could present me holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight if I believe it. And I believe it. Yay. So guess what I am right now? You say, you're freaking out. You're flaky. No. You know why I'm flaky? I'm holy, blameless, and above reproach in his sight. And I believe it. And I have confidence before him. Because I have a high priest, Jesus, who's passed through the heavens, the Son of God. And he's mediating at the right hand of Almighty. And his blood is speaking better things. I'm having a good day. Yeah? But watch. You can celebrate all that redemptive truth. You better get this. You can say, am I covering y'all? She said, are you going to jump around? I said, I hope not, but I have to. Sorry. It's the way you have the church set up. I got to be personal. It just feels good. <laughs> am I messing up too bad? See, I'll, I'll. Okay. All that redemptive truth is so powerful to amen all day long. We can jam out and shout it and celebrate it. But if you don't marry that to a pure motive of why you're excited about that being true in your life, if that, 
If all them redemptive truths are just for your sake, and you don't learn what it means to seek first the kingdom and put on Christ, how's the world benefit by us just embracing those redemptive truths and feeling close to the Lord? If we don't understand, he wants to live in us and shine through us in every situation. He wants to move through us. He wants us to pray for people and he'll show up. He'll give us words. He, he wants us to love when people are unlovely. When you're done wrong, he doesn't want nobody to be able to tell you were done wrong and you don't even feel done wrong because you're overwhelmed by being done right. And you're going to overcome evil with good. And you're going to let mercy Triumph over judgment. You're going to tone down a harsh word with a kind word. You're not going to give somebody a piece of your mind. I mean, how much could we really give? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Ain't that something, though? That's self focus. Your little wife, she's, isn't it awesome? I made her little. Your little wife, she's at home, and she's interceding. She's praying for your day, and, and you come in because she knows you've been struggling at work and the boss and some of the stuff, and, oh, yeah, oh, and she's just praying. She's a good little girl. You come home, and she's like, how was work, honey? I've been praying all day. You know what? I finally stood up. I finally gave that boss a piece of my mind. And she's like, huh? Yeah, I was just done him stepping all over me. I spoke up. I told him this. I put him in his place. See, when people do that and they finally speak up and they're telling it, they feel like all roostered up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And they're like, they're somebody now. They find identity in that. They just told him off, gave him a piece of my mind. <laughs> yeah? See, so you're not on the earth to give him a piece of your mind. You're on the earth to give him Jesus. And your little wife's praying for you to intercede him for you to have this amazing day. And you're getting tricked. You're getting tricked. You're getting tricked into feelings, hurt, unresolved conflict, letting things build up to where you say, I can't take no more. Well, we better get back to following Jesus. Because he said, follow me in the things that I do, you'll do if you believe. Wonder if Jesus stopped and said, can't take anymore. Wonder if Jesus just dropped the cross and gave up. I'm done with this idiot people hitting me, smacking me around, having no clue who I am. Didn't I already tell them I'm the son of God? Didn't I tell them you were my father? Didn't I come to save them? Ain't I have the good shepherd? Who didn't I heal? Who didn't I forgive? Who didn't I cleanse? Who didn't I feed? I'm done with these people hitting on me. Barabbas, are you kidding me? He killed a man. I raised the dead. He causes conspiracy. I'm trying to bring peace and they want to kill me. I had enough. Man, you ain't never seen that in Jesus. And when we, when we portray it as Jesus, we think it's kind of a silly illustration because we know he ain't like that. But he said, follow me. He's firstborn among many brethren. First John 2 says, if you say you abide in him, you ought to walk even as he walked. Oh, I got scripture all over this thing. I read the book a couple times. <laughs> he modeled a life that we were created to live. He showed us what we were always here for. See, nobody ever taught me that when I went to church. Nobody ever showed me that I could actually follow Jesus by the person of Holy Spirit. If I'd have told somebody I was going to love like Jesus loved, they'd say, well, you can do your best, but you can't love like Jesus loves. Jesus only Jesus. Only one is Jesus. Jesus. He's the only one. Jesus. You know, when I did that little illustration of having Jesus having a little meltdown, people say, well, he can't do that because he's Jesus. He can't do that because he's love. Exactly. Ain't that so good? Just sit on that. It's getting in you. He can't do it because he's love, not because he's Jesus. If, if, if the only answer is, well, because he's Jesus, then we can't follow. But if it's because he's love, we can follow, can't we? Yes. Whoa. Mm -mm 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 -mm. 
Ain't that something? Whew. You know, a lot of people do that. Jesus doesn't even want you to see him that way. He wants you to see him as someone he can follow. When Christians say, yeah, but that was Jesus, that is not a form of honor. It's a form of deception. Because life in the spirit says you can follow him because he himself said the things I do, you'll do if you believe. So see, something's always after winning over your belief. Something always wants to own your belief. Circumstances, life, past stories go through my story. Be careful with my story. What about his story? If your story isn't full of redemption and springing you into new life through Christ, then maybe you shouldn't be writing the book about everything you went through. Because all of a sudden, the highest grace you're trying to receive is somebody cares about what you've been through. Look, I'm not being rude and demeaning. I'm saying this stuff tries to own your identity. And all of a sudden, the highest grace you can receive is if somebody cares about your story. And we call that compassion and sensitivity? No, that could be empowerment and keep you in the same place. And all of a sudden, 10, 15 years later, you just got a couple people around and say, oh, you don't know what they've been through. And then they're telling your story. Well, if it has no redemption, what's, what's so exciting about the story? Because you're just talking about what lost people did that didn't know him and how you responded. Look, if Uncle so-and-so would have knew Jesus and been filled with the Holy Spirit, he wouldn't be in your story like he is. So from the get-go, there's things designed and there's strategies and schemes of the devil designed to get your heart and tie it up, bind it up, blind it, harden it, break it. Do you ever notice the things you think you needed the most growing up wasn't the thing that wasn't there? The thing that you didn't ever want to happen is the thing that happened. And then you tell your friends, oh, I would just, if this would ever happen, I would just die. And then it happened. There's things tracking, trying to make sure that you are so messed up that by the time you hear the good news, there ain't nothing good about it because of your story. Oh, he's the deliverer. He's the deliverer. <laughs> I could rip off the story of my yesterday, and some of you would be like, because you can't see my story. <laughs> I'm not a product of my story. I've been saved. <laughs> Born again. I ain't writing a book about who did what when I was three and how I when I was eight. And then I, if it's not full of redemption and bringing glory to God, why are we even writing this stuff? There's tons of those books out there. If they don't end in Christ, what did we write it for? Still trying to get something from our story that we never got. See, here's the thing. What you've been through is not the truth about who you are. What he went through is where the truth about who you are is found. What he went through is where you find you. Are you with me? You see what's wrong with me? You see why I'm always going to be like this? He said, you're worse. My whole Christian life preaching, I'd say, next time you see me, if you ever see me again, I'm going to be this way or worse. I've said it for years. You know why? Because the next time you see me, I just might know him a little bit more. Oh. You get it? Just get to know him a little bit more, and then I'll be a little more like, oh. Doesn't mean we don't have challenges. We all have circumstances. We all have situations. Yeah? We're losing people along the way. Loved ones, it's happening to everybody. We, got, we, we bump into things all the time. But I gotta read this scripture because if we don't understand that we're running a race, we're in this journey, we got a destiny, but you gotta have a goal. If you're in a race, there has to be a finish line. You can't just be running around the track in a crowd with no strategy to get to the line. 
I mean, an athlete, even Paul uses the illustration of an athlete and says when he competes, he does it according to the rules. And we got to make sure we do. Or we'll find ourselves disqualified. You can't just be out there saying, well, I'm running. Well, you got to be pinpoint. You have to... You have to understand that there's, like with an athlete, there's a time range. If he's running a mile, he's trying to get in a time zone to even be competitive. If he can't in that time zone, he ain't even getting in the race. Are you all with me? So we got to redeem the time. The days are evil. We're closer now than when we first believed. We're, every step we take is taking us one step closer to when we stand before him and answer for our lives. And you, you think we're going to stand before him and say, oh, I'd have tried harder if it wasn't for, why didn't you answer my prayer when I was, I prayed to you for years. <laughs> nope, you're going to go, duh. Ah. Because in the light of who he is, all that stuff, all that stuff that was tricky, that had self-centeredness tied to it. Come on, I'm not being mean. Feeling sorry for your I just lost my brother a couple weeks ago, suddenly, suddenly. He's in my yard, we butchered a deer. We're hunters, sorry. <laughs> There's a lot of animals gave their life for the gospel. <laughs> we're just hunters, so we're in the yard. I live in a suburb. I built these poles, looks like a hangman post, looks like I'm from the Wild West. Neighbor said, what is that? I said, I'm the new block watch leader. I'll be putting a rope there in the next day or two. <laughs> it looks just like a hangman post, man. It's in my backyard. It's nine foot. It's nine foot four by fours. Tall. Put them three foot in the or about two foot in the ground. It's up there. I get on a ladder to hook my little chain. I hoist my deer up right in my suburb backyard. I skin them right in the yard and butcher them completely. Right in my suburb yard. My neighbors. <laughs> they either love me or avoid me. I don't know. I don't know. No. One little girl next door, she comes running out. As soon as she sees me pull up a deer, she comes out. She's 17, 18 now. She just leans on the fence. This is so cool. She was homeschooling. I said, this is like your biology class. <laughs> so I'm showing her all these parts. <laughs> But he's in the yard. We're butchering a deer. He's all happy he got this deer. Butchering a deer. He's taken to the butcher. It was the last I ever saw him. He never came out of the butcher. He just fell over. No idea. No inkling. Total shock. Heart just stopped. Just stopped. The lady at the butcher shop cried and cried and cried. I had to go get his vehicle. She cried and cried and said it was the most awful thing she ever saw. She said... He came in, I love your brother, he's the nicest, kindest guy, he had a great resume. He said, we hugged, I said, so good to see you, wow, you got deer, yeah. Well, you know the routine, and we went in and waited, came out. I grabbed my book and said, so what do you want to do? Go on. Laughing, talking, go on. It's sobering. Now see, when I'm talking and preaching, you can't tell. It doesn't mean I didn't miss him. I cried terrible. When I lost my brother, he's my buddy. We were like friends. We weren't just brothers. We did everything together. Like he was my go-to guy. So that was October 9th. Since that happened, I've thought of him a thousand times over. I almost texted him a thousand times. Every time something cool happens, he's the first person I want to tell. And then I have to, ooh, he's not here. But when you're in a race, you don't live sentimental. I'm not, I'm not, why would you let that happen, God? No, you put your son on the cross. We have everlasting life, eternal life through Jesus Christ. My brother's not dead. I had him for 61 years, and it was amazing. 20 more would have been great. But 61 was amazing. And if it wasn't for the blood of Jesus, he'd be gone, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, and it would be over, total loss. But it isn't the truth. It's not the truth. Like, like I pulled in my driveway from the hospital, he's gone. And I'm sitting in my driveway and I'm like, Lord, I'm never gonna see his face again. I'm never gonna talk to him, never gonna text him, never gonna my phone's never gonna go and it'll be him. 
I'm never going to get into something in the outdoors and run into something really cool and then, boom, try to get him in on it again. We'll never be in the truck together again. I'll never see him pull up in his truck and get out with his stuff and his little cooler. And I'm just sitting there. Just My mind is just like, wow, death. is It was just right in front of me, the sobriety of passing. And all of a sudden, I just started thinking about the blood and eternal life. And my goodness, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I don't believe he's in a holding tank, Lord. I believe he's in your immediate direct presence. You paid the price for my brother to live forever. And I'm going to sit here and sulk in sorrow because he's dead. He's not dead. So we're going to run a race. We'll live a prize. We're going to all cross the finish line and all rejoice together that we believed. That's what we're going to do. Do I miss him at times? Absolutely. Did I cry hard when the reality of him not being here hit me? Absolutely. Probably the hardest I've cried since I've been born again. Was it a negative cry? No. Just a real cry, physical loss cry. Have I cried and cried and cried since? No. Have I missed him? Yeah. The eternal purpose of God and the truth about Christ in a heart of faith is way greater than the physical loss. That's why Paul said we don't grieve as if we have no hope. He didn't say we don't grieve. He said we don't grieve as if we have no hope. So when you grieve and lose your disposition, you've crossed the line. When you grieve and lose your purpose, when you change your view of God because of the loss of a loved one, you'll be thankful for the birth of a loved one. It wouldn't hurt so bad if it wasn't so good. So we ought to be full of thankfulness. Are you guys with me? I'm just kind of like sharing just so you can relate that I'm not just here putting on a preacher jacket and I'm supposed to go, wow. No, my brother just passed, and it's real. A little over a month and a half ago. It's very real. Walking his wife through all kinds of details. and That side of home that she wasn't involved in, that he took care of. Phone calls and banks and stuff. Just being there for her and surrounding her on her birthday. And my family taking her in on Thanksgiving and assuring her, listen... Just because he's not here doesn't mean you're not family. You've been family for 27 years. You're family. And she cried because she doesn't have family on her side. She cried and realized we love her like she's our own. Yay. So it's always about laying down your life for his namesake. It's always about seeking first the kingdom of God. See, if you wake up and you start praying that way and you get that in you to where Holy Spirit has that in you, where you've released faith into that truth and that truth has become yours. And all of a sudden, that's what you see. Seek ye first the kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom. It changes how you respond. You won't have fallouts. You won't have meltdowns. You can't even teach this stuff because people get condemned and then they get judged and then they get legalism, like trying to be. I'm not talking about controlling my emotions. I'm talking about I'm getting realigned through what I see and believe. Like having a motive in my life that's so different that everything follows it. When I'm not trying to be okay. I'm not trying not to be angry. I'm not trying to forgive. <laughs> Christians are notorious for that. Well, brother, you got to forgive. What you well, I know, but just give me time. Things take time, brother. Run that by Jesus. See if he agrees. Where'd you learn that? That forgiveness takes time. Because if you're trying to forgive, you're in unforgiveness. wonder if God was trying to forgive you. wonder if he was trying to get over you. That would make you insecure. You wouldn't have confidence to approach him. You could never really be one. You'd be insecure and uncertain around him. See, he'd be almighty and all-knowing and omnipotent and omniscious, almighty God. But if he wasn't love, he wouldn't be so attractive. See, people don't talk about this stuff, but wonder if God wasn't love. 
See what makes him so attractive. So to, see, he could have all power, but he could be a control freak. He could be all knowing. He could be the one that was and is and is to come from the beginning, but he could have favorites. He, he might just not like your or my personality. He might just like your wife better. <laughs> he said, he does. <laughs> wonder if God was like we grew up like it just we just got wonder if we just got on his nerves and rubbed him wrong sometimes. Wonder if he just didn't like you. And then he'd just say, look, there's just something about you just bothers me. Can't really put my finger on it, but you just bother me. I mean, you'd really come out of the throne room like, woo-hoo! No, you'd be devastated and hopeless and finished. See, if God wasn't love, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Then it would all be everybody shoving and trying to be the favorite and teacher's pet and doing whatever you could do to be in and not out. And it would just be chaos and crazy. If you take love out of something, there is nothing. God is love. Yes, he's omnipotent. Yes, he's almighty and powerful. But he's love. The Bible describes him He's love. And you can find a million adjectives almost for God. But guess what it says? He's love. It means everything he is and everything he does flows through and out of love. So he made us in his image and says, if he loved us that way, this way, shouldn't we love one another? Now that's become religious language in the church if we're not careful. It's just the right thing to say but it's the right thing to become. We're not looking for agreeing speech. God paid for transformed lives. So if we're become love, why are we trying to forgive? Why are we still mad at so-and-so? Why don't we even want to go to church because that pastor and I'm done and that's two pastors in a row and they're just saying, you know what, now I stereotype my whole view of churches. And that's all you talk about. And the three people you talk to, they got their own issues unresolved. Now you got a little thing going. Now you're the first hurt church of the brethren. <laughs> or something. <laughs> I don't know what you want. It wouldn't be good. <laughs> Do you understand that everything has children? Do you understand that there's this everything bearing fruit after its own kind? Each seed, it's first law, first law in the Bible. Seed time and harvest time, each seed after its own kind. So everything has children. Everything is trying to reproduce and multiply what it is. Everything's like trying to pass on its genes. Watch, if you live in discouragement, it will birth desire in you that you wouldn't have if you weren't discouraged. And the survival instinct would cater to that desire because discouragement would become the issue. And now everything you're doing is because you're discouraged. Where if you weren't discouraged, you wouldn't even have the desire. So all of a sudden, the thing you're doing is the children of discouragement. People have unresolved conflicts. They have hurt and pain. They don't get over the hurt in a relationship, and they think the, the answer is to just jump right back into another one. And they're still carrying the pr- pain and the fragment, fragmentation of the other relationship into this relationship. Now, this person might really be sincere and love them, and their trust is broken. They're insecure. They've been betrayed and treated wrong, and now they're looking at this person through all that stuff. You see what's so amazing about God being love? None of that's going on. (laughs) No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, he's saying, I know you from the beginning. I know what you're here for. I know what you're created for. I know what you'll look like when I'm in you. And if you yield to me and surrender, wow, that's worth paying for. Love you. (laughs) 
Yeah, but Lord, love you. Yeah, but what about love you? <laughs> Just pull out, love you, 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 love you. <laughs> love you. <laughs> Woohoo! <laughs> You're flaky? Yeah. <laughs> I'm loved. But I'm not just love. Don't you stop there. Let's not let this be the new language that we're just sons. Sonship has an expression. There's scriptures that says we live a certain way because we're sons. Yeah? Sonship isn't like the new fancy confession on the earth that makes us feel better. <laughs> See, because the goal isn't God loves me. That's the introduction. The goal is you becoming that very love. The goal is not being loved by God. And that's what we talk about nonstop. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. But it should take us to becoming that love. Why? Because we're the body of Christ. Who's the expression of Christ on the earth? Holy Spirit filled believers. The lights of the world. Let your light so shine before men so they see your life and go, wow, there's a God. That has to do with your attitude, forgiveness, mercy, the way you carry yourself through situations. That has to do with people knowing exactly what you've been through, but when they look at you, they realize you don't look like you've been through that. But yet they realize you're not in denial. And all of a sudden they think, wow. What? And after a while they come to realize it's just the way you see. Yeah? And all of a sudden you just see different. Because he's different. Yeah? And he called us out of darkness. Sometimes we think darkness is just like murder, lust, and, 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 and all this stuff. You know, darkness is self-centeredness. Darkness is thinking and living anything that he's not. Offense is darkness. It says if you hate your brother... You're in darkness until now. So watch. So if you're in darkness until now, then you're not shining as a light. If you're in darkness, you're not shining as a light. Come on, this isn't heavy. You're the lights of the world, but if you hate your brother, you're in darkness till now. So why is it so hard? Why is it so hard to forgive? Because we think we have rights. We think because that self-centered lie thing we were born into. It's, you got to get that off of you. you got to get alone and say, God, you never created me for me. And I'm done living for me. I'm done believing. For, like the world trained me this things about me. That I got these chips on my shoulder that I didn't even put there. Like there's lines in my life. I didn't even draw the line. It was just society just built it in me. I was homeschooled in the wrong home. I was trained by lies. And all of a sudden there's these expectations. And just because of who you are in my life, there's an unspoken expectation. That's a line you can cross. And if you cross it, then I have a right to be whatever that produces. It's not the kingdom of God. And why that's so crafty and so detrimental is that when you live that way, you're not shining. And the whole reason you're on the earth is to shine. So if you were the enemy, you'd say, whoa, really blew it when I crucified the Son of God. And if kings and the rulers of the earth would have known what they were doing, they would have never crucified the Son of God. But they did. So let's just make it like it's no big deal and nothing really extraordinary happened. And let's just keep the people the same. Let them go to church. Let them sing their songs. Just keep them from loving. Let's just mix that little self-centered, what about me? Will that hurt? Well, how do you think I, why did you have to? Well, I don't have, or well, I ain't coming in. And let them go all through the right motions and never become the right thing. And then it'll be as if he never really did die and raise from the dead. And let's just make it all about them. Forgiven, go to heaven. Blessing, provision, protection. Instead of new life through Jesus Christ. Transformation and change. Yeah? Come on. If you were the enemy, wouldn't you do that? 
If every sign follows the believer, wouldn't you try to make sure people don't believe right? You wouldn't even be so scared that they go to church. You'd just be scared that they see. Yes. Going to church can be dangerous if you go and don't see. Because going, going to church can take the place of what you're created to be. And you can let church attendance take the place of knowing him and becoming what he paid for. You can let your ministry, your title, your position, your calling, and even the true anointing on your life. You can let all those things take the place of knowing him. Are you with me? You don't ever want to do that. That would be a lie. Because those things won't take you through to the end. That's why people have highs and lows. Did you ever notice people have highs and lows, ups and downs, ups and downs? Somehow we think that's normal Christian life. Because everybody's living up and down, flying high. Everybody has their low moments. Flying high, low moments. It's not Christianity. Faith to faith, and we're all ascending into him. We're all growing righteous. The righteous are growing. It's brighter and brighter. Yeah? Yay. But if you don't have these perspectives, these healthy motives in your life, you see how stuff's designed to sneak up on you? And you're in all the right places, saying all the right things, living from the wrong places. And you're letting something matter more than what matters most. And in most cases, it's not even because people are evil and hypocrites. We're destroyed for the lack of. So if we can get the knowledge, we can stop destruction. And maybe it's not God's fault after all. <laughs> well, why did God allow? Why? Well, that's what makes me so mad. Well, I'm just done praying. Do you ever hear people just do that? Just go on a rant? Like subpoena God in their mind, take him to court, and judge him right in their mind. Because they got all the facts. That's a sure sign of the fall of man. <laughs> when man becomes so wise, he can just run a few facts through his mind and judge Almighty God who was from the beginning and is and always will be. Oops. Like if you're mad at God, that is not a good testimony. Look, I don't, it, whoever died and whatever, how, I get it. But if you're mad at God and you're in this room tonight and you're mad at God, that should freak you out that you have the audacity to sit in the position to be mad. That's like ludicrous. Like he's the only one that's good. He sent his son while we were yet sinners. He gave us a way of escape. And the enemy has flipped you to see the only one that's good as if he's the problem. Totally perverted you. The only answer for salvation, and you've turned on him in your mind because of your circumstances, because of self-centered assessment. But yet the, the beginning stage of a Christian, he's supposed to deny himself. Pick up his cross and follow Jesus. Yeah, but they're hard on me every day. I was at that job and prayed and prayed, and God never gave me another job. I put in 15 resumes and never got a call back, and I got stuck in this place. I feel like God's punishing me at this job. You're called to shine on that job. You're called to walk in Christ. Nobody was guaranteed from the Lord's end that they were going to treat you right, that if you were going to live righteous, they were going to persecute you, and if they hated him, they're going to hate you. Come on. You ever see somebody just discouraged because whatever they're praying for to happen, God hasn't done it? For two years goes by and you're like, well, I've been praying and praying and praying. I don't know why God hasn't. That right there is probably why. <laughs> that attitude to choose and out of you when you're talking, it's probably a good reason why. He probably bawled and changed you to your workplace till you get a revelation. <laughs> he gave you a life sentence. <laughs> Till you live in the realm of life. Why would he give you a new job? He wants to change the way you see your boss, not give you a new boss. Because if you don't see your boss different, you go to the other job, and the next thing you know, something's going to be wrong with that boss. Four jobs in, your heart's so hard, you're wondering why God always sticks you with these jerks. 
And there's no compassion, no love. There's pride in your heart and self-righteousness. You're looking down on people as if, and now your preference is Lord. And all of a sudden, somehow you slipped into this place where you think God is in position just to meet your needs. Come on, that's intense. See, when people get tricked into this stuff, you can always see it because of what it produces in their life, and it never looks like Jesus. You know them by their... So I guess we're really supposed to bear fruit. And I guess we'll know us by our fruits. Yeah? Yeah? That's why you have a body. Don't be mad at it. <laughs> Don't be mad at your body. The reason you have a body is to act out the inside. The body gives expression to the thing you're housing. So house him. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Let him move in and never move out. <laughs> yep. Come on. They'll know us by our fruits. And this the Father's well pleased that you bear much. And that's your fruit. And if you bear much fruit, guess what he's going to do? He's going to trim you, prune you. Why? So you bear even more. You got this one little life, wisp in a vapor, here today, going tomorrow. Come on. If you're 15, you know what I mean. Because when you were 8, you didn't think you'd ever be 15. If you're 20, you know what I mean. If you're 25, you really know what I mean because you're past 21 and you're four years past any goals. Because <laughs> it was 12, it was 16, it was 18, it was 21. And now it's like, Aah! help! Because there's no more goals. <laughs> and, and now your hair's white. And on December 9th, I'll be 60. I can't fathom that, but it's true. I've been on the earth 60 years, wisping a vapor. Yeah? I've been saved 26 years. Can't even fathom it. Feels like I just got saved. I feel like I just got saved. Oh, now I can't lay hands on anybody. <laughs> See, I'm smart. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Come on. Who knows what I'm talking about? Who's more than 60? Yeah? Yeah? Well, look at that. Okay. You all know what I'm talking about? You're telling stories, and they're 45 years old. And, and when you're telling them, they're fresh. I, I noticed it a while back. I'm like, oh, no. I'm in that place where I'm telling stories, and they're like 35 years old. Almost 40. Y'all know what I'm saying. But you can't relate to that many years. However old you are on your birth, from, you know, from birth, chronologically, it, it, it's a blur. It's a blur. Here today, gone tomorrow. Redeem the time, days are evil. This is not about just doing a service, being in a safe haven, getting around some people where I feel safe. That's all self-centered. You'll be vulnerable and scared in life. You know why the elections moved the body of Christ so bad? And you know why COVID freaked us out totally? Because of what I'm saying. Because we haven't had a higher vision for why we're alive. And we get tricked into survival. And when you're in survival, fear will drive your life. And when you live in fear, you have no authority when you speak the name of Jesus. It becomes a method instead of power. Because you have no authority over what you fear. And you can turn that book into a bunch of principles that you're quoting. When there's fear in your life. But if you love not your own life unto death and you denied yourself and picked up your cross and follow him then fear has no place because everything has children you see how your motive will birth healthy things in your life you get it that's why if your eye is 
single. Not wide view lens, multiple choice. Yeah, but you know, brother. <laughs> yeah, but not everybody. You know, sometimes. <laughs> it's amazing how quick we are to speak and throw opinions. People that have never even sincerely been with him. Sincerely just shut everything off and just sought him and been with him quick with opinions. Just because they know what a Bible verse says. And now you got four interpretations of one verse. All coming out of different motives. Ain't that something? Isn't it something how James says, be slow to anger, slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to listen. Slow to speak, slow to anger, and quick to listen. And almost all of us by instinct have grown up, got a whole lot to say, ticked off, don't want to hear it. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's true. The total opposite of what we were created for. Guess what love does? Lays down its life for another. Guess what the opposite does? Lives at the expense of someone. How many times have we brought our attitude into our family and it cost our family? How many times have we put pressure on our loved ones because of willfulness and we say we love them, but we put demands and now they're forced to have to respond to us? You're living at the expense of people and you're not multiplying Christ. Yeah? Yeah? Come on. You could just be a young person in your house and you just whatever and just storm off into your room. And nobody can reach you and you won't come out. And now they had supper and you're just in there. Come on, stop it. You're not winning. Nobody's winning. You're putting a demand on your house that Christ would never put. It doesn't even matter if people are wrong. Whatever isn't the answer. wonder if Jesus looked at our lives and said, whatever. Whatever. I don't know. I've just seen people do it. But whatever. <laughs> Wonder if Jesus did whatever. <laughs> Wonder if he's just sitting there with the Father and they're just watching the earth and he goes, oh, 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 whatever. <laughs> and then you all crying out in the name of Jesus in your prayer rally and he's like, whatever. <laughs> you see why it can't be fruitful? Because <laughs> you can't make it him. Like when you put that in him, it's hilarious. It's ridiculous. So if it's silly when you use him as the, and you try to put that on him and it don't fit and it sounds silly, it should sound silly if it's on us because we're made for his image. And he said, the things I do, you'll do if you believe. So you see what it's all about? What do you really believe? Okay, I'm closing with this. Why are you a Christian? Why are you excited about the Lord? Why'd you stand here for about an hour probably and, and worship? Like, why do you want him in you? Because if your answer isn't clean, it'll determine how you live out your life, and you'll know them by their... It doesn't mean we're willful. It doesn't mean we're hypocrites. It might mean we don't see clear and we just don't understand. Like, if you're a Christian for your sake, you're already in trouble. Because you have to be a Christian for his great name. You can't be a Christian for you. That's why it's so detrimental to preach just all these messages that are solely just beneficial. Just message after message that benefits the hearer, benefits the Christian. Now you have disappointed Christians. Well, I don't know why God never did that for me. And then you have other Christians that if it did happen for them, now that's the scale. Like, okay, I'm in. I got special favor. They're still working up to favor. <laughs> Now you got people comparing themselves among themselves, and if things are going their way, they just have more faith. The goal of faith isn't for you to just get a better job. The goal of faith isn't for you to get a pay raise. The goal of faith is that you live your life in a crystal clean, healthy perspective that takes you to the finish line. The faith has nothing to do with praying for the sick. The faith has to do with what you've become now that he came and you're not going to let nothing change your mind. The why behind your life, the purpose of the cross. Satan comes like a roaring lion, seeking who he can devour. 
Resist him. Doesn't say by rebuking him all night long and pleading the blood. Watch. Resist him standing steadfast in the faith. In other words, don't let anything he's doing change your mind about who you are and why. You resist him standing steadfast in the faith. How else could we have one mind, one spirit, one faith? Because we're all supposed to understand why he came, why he's in us, and why we're here. It's called the unity of of faith. It's not everybody interpreting scripture the same. It's everybody interpreting purpose the same. Whew. I'm preaching good in your house. <laughs> you ought to let me come now and then, just now and then. No, I'm just having fun. You're getting something out of this. I can feel it in my heart. Come on, this is why he came. This is what he paid for. So good to see so many young people. Young people listening, because this stuff get in you at a young age, where all of a sudden, you, you, you'll face this stuff all the time where you have options, but wonder if you narrow it down through prayer, communion with God and the Word, to where all of a sudden you don't have options, you have a single eye. Oh, yeah, the opportunity to be offended, it's always there, but it never says you have to be. You get it? The opportunity to be broken, I guess, is always there, but there's no place that says you have to be broken. The opportunity to be discouraged, I guess, if you look for it, it could be there. I never even read Hebrews. Maybe I'll read it tomorrow. Oh, it's so good, too. If I read it now, we're in trouble. <laughs> I'll take us on through till next Thanksgiving weekend. We'll be, like, still here. Beards. <laughs> <laughs> I got I to gotta do this. I got to close. Maybe I'll read it tomorrow. But you got to. Wow. If I do it tomorrow, yeah, please, God. That would be good. I was going to start in 12. So good. Guess what 3 says? Guess what 12.3 says? Consider him. Consider him. Who endured such hostility against himself from sinners. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners. Least you be weary and discouraged in your soul. What's he saying? Consider Jesus, least you think you have some reason to be less than what you see in him. Consider who? Why? Because he's the author and the finisher. Who started this whole thing called faith? The only way it's going to consummate and reach a mature finish is by keeping your eyes on the one it started through. You are not a Christian for things to go the way you hope they go. You're a Christian to shine in the face of however it goes. Watch. I'm just going to be narrow eye because I'm done. And Anything else? isn't scriptural. It's not Christianity. It's just human. It's just people. But if it's him, because if you can't see it in his life, then why would we say it's okay if it's in ours? If when you see him, you see the father and he said, follow me and the things I do, you'll do. If you believe in even greater things, because I'm going to the Father. Yeah? Ain't that good? Yeah. So good. <sighs> what do you want to do? You coming up here? You give me the shepherd hook. You guys. You guys. <sighs> Thank you, Lord. What you got on your as, as a preacher, um, 
I think I'm a preacher. And uh, so I meet Dan in 2009, and I hear this, and I'm thinking, man, that is amazing. But I wonder if he lives it. You know? <laughs> and I'm like a month later, I met Dan again. And, and, and Dan's, we're at a power and love thing, and Dan gets up and says, oh, you know, I just got to tell you something. He says, I had a brand new truck, and I was driving in. You remember the story? Oh, yeah. You all heard this? You know, and I'm here, okay, brand new truck. This lady crashes into the truck. You know, she's all upset. He gets out and he goes up and he's, 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 he's comforting her and, and praying for her. I'm thinking, this is the real deal. This is the gospel. She this, was, she, it, was, it was so fun. She was so upset because she saw the little Pennsylvania registration in the window. It was a brand new truck. It was three months old. She was just staring and I'd already prayed for her husband. Her little granddaughter's in the back crying. I already held her and told her, look, things happen, but that's why Jesus is here. Honey, he's Lord. He changes everything. And I'm rocking her in the back seat, talking to her. And she's like, and she, because she was bawling because of the impact. It, the car parts everywhere. It looked like we should have been dead. I was behind my airbag. I was in a brand new truck. It was the first truck I ever had that had an airbag. And I'm such a little kid. Like, I see the car pull out in front of me. I go, oh, Jesus. And I saw the passenger and I said, oh, and I tried to get in front of him so I didn't T-bone him because I seen a guy. I didn't see the little girl. And as soon as we collided, my airbag just, poof, I remember it imploding. And I was, I remember in my mind going, whoa, that's my airbag. <laughs> like, what? Like, I got an airbag. And I was like, Shh. it was like in the Wizard of Oz, you know, Dorothy's going to go, boom. And everything was stupid. I'm out of there, man. <laughs> I'm having fun with people sometimes when I tell them, I say, man, we hit, everything just went white. And I'm like, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus. Oh, it's my airbag. But it's true. See, now watch this motive. I'm preaching. If I'm not alone, when you're not looking and I'm not yielding myself and praying this into my life and fellowshipping and communing with God through the person of the Holy Spirit. Wow, Father, I thank you. My life is not my own. I thank you today that nobody owes me a thing. God, I thank you that you can live through me and shine through me the power of your Holy Spirit and you can manifest yourself to the hearts of men. God, what an honor to live my life in you. That's how I pray when you're not looking. You get it? So watch. So when the metal crashes, if I'm trying to apply the last sermon I heard Pastor Tim preach on love, I'm late. But if the word becomes flesh and I become that word in the secret place and the metal crashes, guess who's going to respond? What I've become through faith. And all of a sudden I'm not trying to be okay because that's plastic. All of a sudden I'm coming out from behind the, the, and I'm going, okay, okay, that's right. I'm all over YouTube. They call me Pastor Dan. Okay. Okay. I got to shine. I got to, hey, everybody. That'd be weird. As weird as it looked, me acting it out, weird. But if it's become your life, you're not even thinking truck. Truck? Are you kidding? You're thinking people. Nothing's yours. You don't own a thing. Your life is not your own. Yeah? You've been bought with a price. You're not. So it ain't, God, why'd you let this happen in my truck? People bought me this truck. I thought it was a blessing. What are you trying to teach me, Lord? Why did you, why did you have my rear car? God! <laughs> or worse yet, I look at my truck before I even look at... Oh. Oh. And then I'm telling her 10 minutes later why it's okay. When I already showed her it's not. Oh, oh, oh. But if you're living this thing, you run over, you pray for the man, you pray for the girl, you run around to her and she's just staring. And you say, honey, I'm, I want to pray for you that you never have symptoms, a flashback of this, that you never have repercussions, that you just be healthy and whole and like this would be like it never happened. She's just acting like I'm not even there. She's just staring. I said, honey, is it okay if I pray with you? She said, oh, no. It's a brand new truck. She said, I hit a brand new truck. And you know how she feels? She's carrying pressure. Watch. I am not anointed of God to put another brick on her shoulder. I'm here to take off of her shoulder and take the yoke from around her neck. 
She's feeling the weight of responsibility. She made a mistake. She's got enough weight just with insurance. And Here's what I didn't know. That wasn't her car. It was her daughter's. You know why? She totaled her seven days before. And you know what else? She just turned 65. So now she's under pressure. Am I losing my competency? Am I losing my, should I even be on the road? Am I going to kill somebody? Now she's under pressure. And the last thing she needs is Pastor Dan, Christian Dan, kicking the dirt, value in his truck more than her soul. But I didn't have to think about any of that because that's already taken care of. So I said to her, Honey, it's a truck. You're what matters. She got so mad at me. She doesn't know who I am. She thinks I'm just an onlooker. She thinks I'm somebody that heard metal crash and came running out of my house. She don't know who I am. Do you know what she said? She said, that is a brand new truck. She said, I hit a brand new truck. That driver is going to be so mad at me. You see why I'm a Christian? That's called fruit. I tipped her little chin. I said, honey, I am the driver. Watch what she did. Oh, God bless you. Fell on my shoulder and I just rocked her. Guess what's going on now? Because grandma flipped. That driver. Guess what little granddaughter's doing in the back? She freaked her out. I said, that's your little granddaughter? She said, yeah. I said, can I get in the back of your car? Do you mind if I... The little girl heard me. She's never met me in her life. I opened the door. She's crawling across the long back seat. Crawls on me like a little kitten. And I just cuddle her and hold her and talk to her about the peace of Jesus. Pray over her, kiss her little forehead over and over. Little 13-year-old girl. Just rocking her in Jesus. Going to have an accident, you ought to have Jesus in the back seat. <laughs> Policeman came. Policeman came. I'm talking, we're sharing. I said, oh yeah, I'm fine. I pray for everybody. He said, you sure have a good attitude about all this. <laughs> I said, well, I, was there, what other attitudes? He said, oh, I can give you a few options. <laughs> He's a policeman. He sees it all. He sees people screaming and yelling and you jerking. Didn't you see the stop sign? And wonder if you'd have killed my kids. And I'm taking you to court. I'll have everything. Yep. No, no, Jesus gave everything so that I could have him. Woo. And I don't care about your liability lawsuits and your millions of dollars. If I don't have him at that accident scene, I'm bankrupt already. You can give me a hundred million dollars. If I don't have him, I am totally broke. Three months later, I'm doing a healing service in the southern part of town, down in the county. A three-charge Methodist church said, would I come to the one building and share on healing because they believe in it but don't know how to touch it. And we've heard so many good things about you, sir. I said, I stayed calm. Yeah, I'll, yeah, okay, I'll do it. I hung over the phone. Ah! I went crazy. This straight up denominational church is telling me, will you come down and do healing services? So I show up, I show up. I'm preaching my great sermon. I'm sharing this guy in the back standing up. And I think he's got a bad back and he's just stretching. And I talk a long time. And I'm thinking. And then all of a sudden I just kept. And I said, sir, do you, wanna, do you have something to say? Or, he said, yes, sir. I said, what's going on? I thought maybe you were just. No, no, I wanted to make a comment. And I said, okay. And I, just, I figured if it's messed up, we'll straighten it out and protect everybody and protect him. I'm pretty bold with that stuff. We'll fix it. We'll fix it. He said, were you in an accident in early April? Over on, I said, yeah. He said, I didn't think you'd recognize me. I'm not in uniform. I'm the officer. Wow. Now watch. No, no, you don't even have any idea. You, don't even, you can't even make this stuff up. Like, like, like watch. I could have been 10 other things maybe at that accident scene. But I'm like, Jesus, why? He's in me. It's why I wake up. It's why I'm alive. Because he's in me. 
Watch, watch. He said, people, because when I do a healing service, I, I teach like I did tonight. I don't just teach on the details of healing. The first thing I teach about is becoming love and living like he paid for. I do that all the time. He said, I just, watch what this guy said. I got this live infomercial. He said, I just want you to know, people, that this man is for real. And that everything you hear him saying, I saw at the scene of an accident. Now watch what he said. He said, but what you don't understand is this is my first time ever walking through the doorway of a church. And I'm 40 years old. He said, I had a tragic thing happen at the hands of a, quote, Christian when I was eight years old. And I settled in my heart, I will never be a Christian I will never be around Christians, and I will never go to a Christian church. And he said, I stuck to it my whole life. I have never. He said, but when I met that man, he pointed to me. When I met that man, I couldn't get out of my mind. And I said, you know, when I was eight and that happened, maybe I judged something rash. Maybe I, he said, maybe I met the real and the true. Watch. He said, I couldn't get this man out of my mind. I couldn't get the way he carried himself, the things he said. He was so okay. I just couldn't get it out of my mind. He said, I just got diagnosed with a pretty serious diagnosis, da, da, da. He said, my friend here, he pointed to his friend. My friend here said, hey, I drove by the billboard over there at the church, and it says there's a healing service. Why don't we just go? We'll sit in the back. If it's weird, we'll leave. No, 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 just kidding, just kidding, kidding, kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> so watch this, watch this, watch this. He said, before I met this man at the accident, he said, I would have laughed him right out of my car. I would have never even, it wouldn't even been a possibility. But he said, as soon as he suggested it, because of meeting him, as soon as he said about it, I just instantly said, okay. And for the first time in my life, I came through the church doors. This is my first time. And he said, and I had no idea what I was coming to. And I came through the doors and I look up and behold, it's the very man standing in the front of the church teaching. See, see, and if you're not careful, you just think you were in an accident. And now it's all about you and the inconvenience and hoping God moves and strikes the insurance company with a spirit of generosity and bind a spirit of ripoff and just make it all about you coming out of it clean and better than before. But if you seek first the kingdom of God and your life for his name's sake, it's not about your truck or your money. It's about those people. And I wasn't even aware one iota about the officer. I was just busy being me. And he was getting rocked for the rest of his life. So you brought that story up, and then I talked it out for So, <laughs> now... I'm glad Dan shared it because you hear these truths and then I'm sitting there thinking, oh, you know, the, the cynic that we are, you know, I wonder if this, this guy's living this stuff, you know what I mean? It sounds good. Then he told that story, I'm thinking, I've never heard a testimony like that ever. You know, it was like, ever. And then, like a month or two later, Todd shows up at another meeting in Westchester, another power love. Todd has an accident and he's his, Dan's uh, disciple. This guy, the young kid crashes in the back of his truck or whatever it is. Uh, Todd gets out, calms the kid down. The kid's all upset. My father's going to kill me. It's his car, blah, blah, blah. You know, then uh, uh, he calms the kid down. He said, call your dad. Dad comes all upset, blah, blah, blah. Guy's limping. Todd lays his hands on the guy. He, the father gets healed. I mean, it was just like, uh, I'm listening to these two guys. I'm thinking, you never hear this. You know what I mean? It's all about us. It's all about us. And feel sorry for me and everything else. But to, to shine like Dan shines and like Todd and, 
and so many of us who have watched these clips and have heard these truths. And that's what really, you know, really kicked it into another gear. And I'm thinking, okay, that's that car story. And the thing is, when I heard it, you hadn't even told the cop story yet. So I didn't even know if that happened at that time. I just thought it was amazing when he told the car story. But this makes it all even better, you know what I mean? Oh, it's unbelievable. I didn't tell that for a long time, and then I was like, that's like the rest of the story. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's why we love Dan, you know what I mean? I have to apologize. I said I, I introduced him as Dan Del Vecchio. Did, I, did anybody pick up that? <laughs> that was the apostle I trained with in Spain. Dan's like my spiritual father. So I've got too many Dans in my life, you know what I mean? But they're all aces, you know what I mean? <laughs> but he, I know he's not offended, so I don't care. <laughs> anyway, let's stand. <laughs> let's pray. Father, we just thank you for tonight, Lord, and refreshing our hearts and, and renewing our minds in truth, Lord. I thank you, Father, for my brother, Lord. I bless him and his wife and his son and their family, Lord. I just thank you for the uh, grace that's on all of them, Lord. I just pray that you would continue to accelerate them into your goodness and your life and your love, Lord, and that, that these testimonies that are prophetic, you know, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Lord, that these words would be prophetic in us, Lord God, to renew us uh, in truth and in love, Lord. And I thank you for that, Lord. So, Father, I just bless everyone here. I thank them for coming and for the great distance that they come, Lord. And I pray blessing on tomorrow as well, Father. I just uh, pray you would release us in the power of your love and in the amazing grace that's available to every one of us for every need and any moment. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.